All right, let us continue with uh, teaching that we've been teaching on from Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 64, and in the brackets in the Schofield Study Bible, it is the fear and the hope of the remnant, the terufan or the kareta, the remnant, continued. And this is under the black survivors, the remnant. If you look at this remnant, the terufan, and once you do the study, you make that connection. But right here, we was touching on uh, exclusive. Let's bring up this exclusive over here that we've been working on concerning the name of Ras Tefari, the prophetic name of Ras Tefari and Rosh Tiferet. And this particular verse here in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8, where it says, But now, O Lord, but now I deny, but now I bid to, I father his father, father of the house. Thou art, it says, our father. We are the clay, and thou our potter. That's a key significance, our potter. Make a note of father and potter. We're going to do the etymology and link the English um, father and potter with the ancient Egyptian uh, pata and the Ethiopic fitte, the fitte, and it says, and we all are the work of thy hands. We all are the work of thy hands. Now, next to Father right here, you see that there is a subscription number two, and that's now leading us to the footnote down here. Now, in the footnote, it says Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2, and Isaiah LXIV, which is 64 and 8. This is where we're at right now. It says, Israel collectively, the national Israel, recognizes God, recognizes God as the national father. Now, this is the key and significant link with the father of modern Africa. The father of modern Africa, Kedamawi Haile Selassie, the one who is the Aras Tefari. Now, when we say modern Africa, as we have touched on previously, we need to distinguish modern Africa and what we mean by stating modern Africa from postmodern Africa. Now, going on with this particular footnote, and then we'll make that connection, it says that it gives us um, Exodus IV or 4, verses 22 and 23. It says, doubtless, the believing... And I want you to make a note of this, and we've touched on believing, both the true sense of believe, which is trust, and the false sense of make-believe or be lie But it says, doubtless, the believing Israelite, the Israelian, or the Beta Israel, was born anew, was born anew. And now it gives us a reference to John III, or John 3 and 3 and 5 along with John XIII or John or Luke, excuse me, Luke XIII, which is Luke chapter 13, verse 28. But it says that the Old Testament of the OT scriptures show, it says, no trace of the consciousness of personal sonship. That in the New Testament, the Schofield um, reference Bible says it shows no trace. We will amend this and say it shows um, a little active trace, a little active, there's no trace of an active consciousness of personal sonship. Make a note of personal sonship. This is another key right here. Personal sonship in connection with the national father, in connection with the father of Martin Africa or Kadamawi Haile Selassie. It says that the explanation is given in Galatians 4, verses 1 to 7. That the Israelite or the Israelian, though a child, so when we're born again, we become as a child. This is why the teaching on repentance and rebirth is very significant and is in Pearl Majesty's um, interview or the Lutheran interview is very, very important in this connection of sonship and, and, and being born again. Now, the Israelite, though a child, differed nothing from a what? A servant. Make a note of that word servant, servant slash slave. Now, Bamarinya, there is the Baria, the Baria. Now, the Baria both has a racial, has a racial connection both with the um, 
Ethiopian Hebrews at home and abroad, differing nothing from a slave, differing nothing from a black or Bantu or dark-skinned so-called baria, a baria, right? Now it says that the spirit as the what spirit of his son, the spirit as the spirit of his son could not be given to impart the consciousness, the consciousness of sonship could not be given to impart this consciousness, this labona of sonship until, it says, until redemption, until redemption. So that means redemption was the key to the impartation of the consciousness of being conscious of that sonship. Now, redemption is a key theme in Rastafari. We call it the black redemption. And this is very, very important. So until redemption had been accomplished, the spirit of his son could not be given to impart the consciousness of sonship. Now, it gives us Galatians IV or 4, verses 4 to 6, and then the Schofield gives us, it says, C, adoption in Romans VIII or Romans chapter 8 chapter 8, verse 15, and Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. Now, this is very important. This is part of the footnote. Now, the actual footnote up here that we note in um, verse 8 goes to this one right here, the second footnote, which says, here the reference is to the relationship, key word, relationship through creation rather than through faith. So the the Reference to Father that we find in Isaiah chapter 64 has to do with the relationship through creation. Now, we've noticed that this Father is the national Father, you understand, or in Rastafari Revelation, the Father of modern Africa, not postmodern Africa, because postmodern Africa is after 74, 75, after the creeping coup against the elect of God. Now, it says that here the reference is to the relationship through creation. The creation of what? The creation of the OAU, the creation of the organization of African unity, the creation of modern Ethiopia, of modern Africa, rather than through faith. Now, why is this significant? This is significant because Haile Selassie is recognized as the father of modern Africa, by most Africans of the time and by many Africans who know the truth even today, but it's not through the, the spirit, you understand, but it's through creation, you understand, it's through creation and creation of this modern Africa. Now, it says, as in Acts XVII, which is Acts um, uh, 17, verses 28 to 29, and there's a note there. But let's return to the first footnote where it says Isaiah 1 and 2. Isaiah 1 and 2, and let's make this Ethiopian connection with the father of modern Africa. Now, when we go to Isaiah chapter um, 1 and 2, this is what's called rightly dividing the word of truth. Isaiah 1 and 2, it reads this. It says, Hear, O heavens. And give ear, O earth, for the Lord Yahweh hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know, is ignorant. Israel is ignorant. The only people who are ignorant, who don't know their, their true name, are niggers, are this body, are the slave servants. They don't know their name. It says, my people, God is saying, my people doth not consider. Now, we have a connection with both the Ethiopians at home in the renewed kingdom of David, Ethiopia, as well as the Ethiopian Hebrews or the Israelites abroad in the captivity in these verses right here. But this is also a link to this fatherhood. In the very first chapters, you understand, of the prophet Isaiah, you understand, where Yahweh's case is against who? 
is against Judah. Now, prophetically, we know that Judah is the so-called, in this prophetic time, the African so-called American. Now, hear, O heaven, give ear, O earth. This means that there is a cosmic or an, an, an astronomical, you understand, an astronomical as well as an earthly significance. And make note of that this present time, 2011 and 2012, even the storm that they say is coming on us might be exceptionally um, furious because of an alignment of the high tides. So we have to understand the, the heavens, you understand, and the heavens relation to the earth and the original um, um, computation of time that we have in the beginning where it says that the sun and the moon and the stars, you understand, are for signs and seasons and days and years. You understand, for Yahweh, yod Hey, vav Hey, have spoken, he has nourished and brought up children, just like his imperial majesty has nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. So we're seeing both the Old Testament, with the Old Testament, Beta Israel, who the diasporas link to this, and with the New Testament, Ethiopians and the Ethiopian Hebrews. The ox knoweth his owner, the ox, which is a, another um, symbol that is used, another mythological symbol of the ox, knoweth his owner. The ass, the ass is also another symbol that is used straight out of Egypt. The ass knoweth his master's crib. In other words, the so-called dumb animals, the animals that don't speak, that don't understand language as we do, they know their owner, they know their master's crib, but Israel, God's son, Remember, Israel is God's son, doth not consider my people, doth not consider, my people don't know, my people doth not consider, Israel doth not know. Israel is ignorant. You know what I'm saying? They are ignorant. They do not know, they do not consider. Then it says in verse 4, it says, ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, with rebellion with sin, hatiyat, a seed or a race of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken yod hey wow hey they have provoked the Holy One of Israel to anger, they are gone away backwards. See, in Rastafari we say forward ever, backward never, but backwards is very a key indication to who they were outside of and before the revelation of Rastafari. Now, let's return to where we were. You know what I'm saying? Let's return to where we were in Isaiah 64 and, and 8. Now, in Isaiah 64 and 8, once again, it says, But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou our potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. Now, we mentioned the, the hand sign of his imperial majesty, as well as reference to the fact that that is the tiferet. Now, tiferet is also an attribute of God. Tiferet is an attribute of God, and it can be explained or bottomed out Kabbalistically. Now, here on our whiteboard, let's go to the whiteboard for a moment. Here on the the, the so-called whiteboard or the dry erase board under our Torah study, we have Isaiah 64 and 8, Father. Now, we linked Father with Potter, you understand, the Potter. And we said it's not Harry Potter, but it's key indication that most folks, when they hear Potter, they were associated with Harry. But what they don't associate with Potter, you understand, is Heru, who is the Potter, or the Ethiopic Egyptian Potter, the Heru, then Ethiopically that is Cherui, Cherui, or Heru, which is a name and a title that means elect, that means chosen, that is in reference to Christ as the Messiah. Now, Potter, as we did the linguistics and the etymology on this from the Ethiopic, Potter is related to the Pita. The Pita, Ethiopically speaking, this is the Fitte, the Fitte, the Fitte. Now we have the Fitta, as in the Fitta Neges, the law, the law, remember Torah, Torah, 
is also law, as well as the orit is in reference to the law. So we have the law or the justice, and the fiti in the gu'is is often translated in the Amharic as the siddik, the siddik or the sedek, the sadok. So we have this this Hebraic and Ethiopic link with the fitta, the pita, as pot, as the pata. But if you look at the etymology, remember it said that all languages came from one language, right? It came from one language and was broken down. Look at the word father, right? The F and the P, the P and the F often interchanges within the Hebraics and in many different languages. Look at the T. You understand the T, which here is a T, you understand? But they have the TH, but the TH is a double T right here because it's pitta, fitta, fitta, pitta, and the R. So when we look at the main letters, we have the F, the T, the H, but the H can also be silent, and then the R. We have the P, the TT, the double Ts, and the R. So we have father, fata, pitta, Pada, like padre. Look at padre. If you look at padre, it's the very same thing except they add an E at the end. You know what I'm saying? So we have the connection now with the pata and the pitta, the fitta, you understand, know and the hari, you understand, know saying, the hari with the cherui or the cheru, the cheru, the cherui, which means the elect or the chosen. So we have Heru, the Pata, or the Pata, who is the Herui. But what is significant about the Pata? See, we have to now ask ourselves, what is significant about this Pata relationship that we find scripturally when we look right here, but now, O oh Lord, thou art our what? Thou art our Father. We are the clay. The potter works with his hands, right? We are the clay, thou art our potter, and we all are the what? The work of thy hand. The work of thy hand. Now, here's where we bring this now forward here to some of our, this is some writings that we're actually doing on Tafari, Tiferet, the Heru, Heru, the potter name, Pata. Heru, the potter name Pata. Now, when we went to Gerald Macy, we had referenced um, Gerald Macy a little bit earlier because he gave the best explication of this ancient terminology in relationship, you understand, to the true interpretation of the Bible, to a truer interpretation of the scriptures. Now, let's see if we can bring this up right here. Let's see if we can go to ancient, ancient Egypt, ancient Egypt, um, light of the world. Because in ancient Egypt, light of the world, one thing that, we'll wait till that comes up, one thing that we'll find in the ancient Egypt, light of the world, once we're able to bring that up, let's see if we, well, let's go to the verse right here. Okay, here we go. Here we go. All right. Okay, here we go. Now, ancient Egypt, light of the world. Take it, let's take it back. Can we take it back one um, one screen or so? Now, w the reference that we looked under was Pata, Macy, and fatherhood. You understand? And we looked it up in the Google books. You understand? Looked it up in some of the Google books, some of the online books. Some of these books, actually, if you look over here, they may give you a download option. Here, it doesn't give you a download option for this particular book. But some of the other books give you a download option. Now, in this particular section on page 345, page 345, is speaking of in an inscription at Edfu, at Edfu, Edfu, they are called the most great of the first time, the August who was earlier than the gods, children of Ptah, children, remember the children link here in Isaiah, who issued forth from him, engendered to take the north and the south to what? Create, to create in Thebes and in Memphis the creators of all creation. Africa awaits her creators. According to the latter or the solar mythology, now the earlier form of a divine fatherhood was outlined, though not perfected. 
this is very key that Macy points this out, that it was outlined the earliest, excuse me, the earliest form of a divine fatherhood was outlined, though not perfected, in the pygmy, the pygmy pata. Now, what do most ones and ones always speak of when they speak of his majesty, of his small stature, of his small size? You understand? The pygmy pata. So this earliest form of a divine fatherhood was outlined, though not perfected. It was not attuned or was not fatuned in the pygmy pata, but it was outlined in the pygmy pata. Hence, one of his titles is the father of all fathers. One of his titles is the father of all fathers. Let's, let's return to this. This is the Google research right here. This was our link that we went to, and this was some of the results that had actually come up. Let us refresh this window. Refresh this window. They know we're getting hot on this. Now they want us to lose this window right here. But you basically seen it. Yeah, I think this was still online, but but the the page is not the page is not coming up at this particular point. All right, we're gonna return we're gonna return to that momentarily. But this is the key link that explains and explicates the background matter, the matter behind the matter. Now, why is it important for us to go there? It's very important for us to go there because this idea of the consciousness of personal sonship, this idea of God being our national father, the father of our nation, you understand, is also um, shadowed. It's very much shadowed when we go to some of the Old Testament books. Let us go to um, Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 30. In Proverbs chapter 30, and this is just one particular reference, but in Proverbs chapter 30, it speaks of the words of Agur, the words of Agur, right? The words of Agur, the son of Jaka, even the prophecy, the man spake to Ithiel, even to Ithiel and Ukal, surely I am more brutish than any man and have not the understanding of a man. I neither learned wisdom, nor have the knowledge of the holy, nor have the knowledge of the caduce. Now, here's the key. Who hath, he asks a question, a series of questions. Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the ring in his fist? And the fist is basically the hand when balled up. Who, continue over here, who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name, and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? You see this key right here? This is a key um, significance right here where it says, what is his what name? What is his name, and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? Now, we're talking about proverbs here. We're talking about Old Testament here, not, not just New Testament. So this idea that um, so-called Christianity with its Jesus Christ or Yeshua HaMoshiach is a new thing because there are some who prefer to say, well, they want to deal with the Old Testament. They cannot really grasp certain Old Testament, I mean, New Testament ideas, and they feel it's false, such as the Father and the Son Hood, you understand, right here in the New Testament, and this is one area, you understand, this is just one particular area. We can also turn, you understand, if we will, we can also turn to the, to the, to the, to the Psalms, you understand, the Psalms, but let's get this next verse. This next verse says that every word of God is pure. He is a shield to them that put their trust in him. Now, you see next to trust? What do you see next to trust? There's a, there's a subscription D, right? There's a subscription D next to trust, right? And when we go to the marginal reference, the marginal reference for D, it says Psalm 2 and 12. Go in close. Can you see that? Psalm 2 and 12. And it says note. So let's go to Psalm 2 and 12. This is what you call rightly dividing the word of truth. You understand? Rightly explaining the scripture. 2 and 12. Let's go to Psalm 2, chapter 2, or Psalm 2 and 12. 
So here we had we had Psalm two, and Psalm two speaks of it's a psalm of the king, first rejected, secondly established, thirdly reigning over what? The nations, reigning over the nations. Now this is a prophetic psalm of Rastafari, and in verse um twelve it says, Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye you all perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their what? Their trust. You see trust? Next to trust there is a subscription too. So now let's go down to the footnote down here and see what trust says. What it says for trust. It says that trust is the characteristic OT or Old Testament word for the NT or the New Testament faith and you see belief. Belief in its true sense of trust and its true sense of faith, not the make-believe or the be lie Eve, but the true sense. Now, the word is really the amen or amen or mamen. You understand? Amen, mamen, amen. Now, it occurs, it occurs 152 times in the OT or the Old Testament and is the rendering of Hebrew words that signify to take refuge, as in Ruth I, I, and 12, or Ruth 2 and 12, to lean on, as in Psalm LVI, or as in Psalm 56, or actually 50, yeah, 56 and 3, and means to roll on, as in Psalm XXII or Psalm 22 and 8, and it also means to stay upon as in Job 35 or XXV and 14. Now, here's what's key about what the Schofield gives us right here, because the Schofield is saying that this word trust is the characteristic Old Testament word for what we find in the New Testament often translated as faith or belief. So when we're in the New Testament come across faith or belief, the root word from the Old Testament is, just, is trust, is trust. There's another link that in our notes we had actually referenced it. Let's go to Psalm for a moment, because this also will connect the tiferet or the fear or the reverence, the reverence of the Lord. Now, here is Psalm 19 to the chief musician, the Psalm of David. Now, when we go to the ninth verse, we find where it says, the fear of the Lord, of yod He wow He is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord, yod He wow He or yod He vav He are true and righteous altogether. Now, if you see right here, it has a uh, subscription one, a subscription one, right? The fear of the Lord. Now, when we go to the, the note, it says that the fear of the Lord is a phrase of Old Testament piety, and the meaning is reverential or tiferet trust, tiferet amen, the tiferet or the tefari hymenot, the reverential trust, and, right, it says trust with hatred of evil. So the fear of the Lord, to understand what it means by the fear of the Lord, which is a phrase of Old Testament piety, or what we call Old Testament religiosity, but there's a spirituality meaning of it as well. Though it may be used religious, for us it's the spiritual, you understand, that is important. And the meaning is a reverential trust. See that word trust again? A reverential trust that is coupled with hatred of evil, of hatred of what Yahweh regards as evil, of what is written as it is written that is Evil. So what we're going to do is we're going to refresh this page on pata or fitta. You know saying it's very important for us to just show you that aspect, and it seems as though this part is not is not coming up in our our particular or peculiar search at this moment. It's coming up blank. But what we will do is we'll pause for the cause. And we'll try to bring it to you, bring it to you otherwise. Once again, we want to just refer to what we have up here because this is a very important teaching. We're speaking of the fatherhood, you know what I'm saying? And His Majesty is 
the father of modern Africa, but not the father of post-modern Africa, but the father of modern Africa linked with the pygmy Pata. You understand? Linked with the pygmy Pata or the Pata. But he's also the Harry or the real Heru. You understand? The real Herui, which is the elect or the chosen. Therefore, Christ in his kingly character or the Messiah in the fatherhood aspect. He's not the Messiah in the sonhood aspect, that is Yeshua HaMoshi or our black Lord Jesus Christ, our black Lord Jesus Christ, but he is the Christ or the Messiah in the fatherhood aspect linked with the fitter, the fitter negest, which is the Ethiopic law of the kings, the justice or the Siddic. And since he is king, and this we need to put up there and note this as well, since he is king, he's not just linked with the Siddic, even though we find the word pata or fitter from the gutters, fitter when it's in the gutters, when it is translated as justice, but also in the sense of law. In the Amharic, when the areas that have fitter is translated, they usually use Siddic, you know, Siddic or Sadic or or perhaps Sadic as in the Melika Sadic. But here, you know, saying we have Melika. You know, saying or let's let's do this like this. Melka, which is M E L K E which means the king of, or actually in the older, the image of righteousness. He is the king of, or the image of, the template of righteousness. So we have a full link with various attributes of Christ in his kingly character, of Kedemawi Haile Selassie, or Rastafari in Revelation, all based on this one area of scripture, Isaiah 64 and 8, which is very, very significant as we link our father, the national father, the pater, you understand, the chosen, the elect, and all of the rest. So stay tuned for the next part of this. Shalom, Ras Tesarim.